G'day and welcome to this bonus episode of the Reboot Your Thinking podcast. This is the podcast that reimagines mindset, mindfulness and mental health from the perspective of somebody who gives and gets therapy. Today I want to talk about something a bit um, different because, and presented a bit differently. Today I want to talk about what a therapy session is actually like. So for a lot of people who have been through counselling or therapy or have a therapeutic relationship with someone like me or another therapist, they'll know this stuff. Um, Some of it, I guess, is the way that I do it specifically. But um, for a lot of people, I think they're just a bit, not scared, but just a bit kind of intimidated by the, you know, what's it going to be like? Do I have to share every single thing about my life? Um, Are they going to judge me? All of that sort of stuff. So... What I thought today is I would just lay out how it goes with me and it might, you know, just convince someone that it's not so terrible or it's not so frightening or whatever and um, and they'll have a go at it So and, and benefit from it as I do um, with my own therapist as well as giving therapy to other people. So I've broken it down into kind of what happens from the start right through. So... Um, yeah, I hope this is useful and 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 sort of allays some of the fears or at least just explains some of the mystique behind um, a counselling session or a therapy session with someone. So the way that it usually starts is there is a, an initial consultation. Um, the very first consultation is really important because it's just a way of the therapist knowing what the other person is there for, you know, what they're actually coming for. Um, as well as uh, letting the person who's receiving the therapy get an idea of what the therapist is like and what the situation and the environment is going to be like for them too. Um, It's typically kind of where we get to know the client and ask about their reasons for seeking therapy. Um, We talk about their background, any concerns they have, what they hope to achieve. So expectations are really important at this point from therapy uh, and it's an opportunity for the client to get to know me as their therapist and for me to determine if I'm the right fit um, for them as well, which is really important and something that's kind of overlooked a bit. It has to be a good fit both ways Um, and that initial sort of consult is is the way to work out whether, okay, this guy's for me or uh, this guy's a bit too laid back or a bit too intense or a bit too whatever. For me, um, you know, it might not be a good therapy fit. That stuff's really, really important, actually. The second thing is confidentiality. Um, and it's really the, the cornerstone of therapy. It's, it's, in some ways, it's the most important thing for a lot of people. Um, and at the start of every relationship I have with someone, I go through a, a confidentiality pledge, a promise that I will... Um, keep whatever they say or whatever I see or whatever they do during during the sessions um, to myself for my lifetime Um, and that's you know in accordance with state and federal laws as well as uh, the benefits of their therapy so uh, that's a super important thing Um, anything discussed in the therapy session is kept confidential um, unless the client poses a threat to themselves or others and and I make that point too that that's when I would break that confidentiality um, when they're when their safety or somebody else's safety um, is potentially compromised. This means that the client can feel safe to share their deepest stuff um, with me without fear of being judged or having any repercussions from it. Active listening is an important part, an important component of therapy sessions. So as a therapist, one of the most important skills I use is active listening. Um, this means that I am fully present and engaged with the client, um, listening to what they're saying, providing feedback that shows that I'm paying attention, um, reflective listening techniques like summarizing what they're saying, paraphrasing what they've said, um, helping the client feel heard and, and understood, um, not, not judging through a listening pose, um, you know, being very neutral in this. Um, being able to say so so sometimes you would hear me repeat back to you what you said um, maybe summarizing it maybe verbatim you know word for word 
but it just uh, using these sort of techniques is a way for me to actively listen for a start so for me to listen what the, to what they're saying as well as show um, the client that I am listening and that they are um, being heard empathy is a key component of therapy and empathy is totally different to therapy right empathy uh, means that I'm able to put myself in their shoes and understand their feelings and experiences I don't try and live those experiences I don't adopt them I don't absorb them into my own being it's really important for my own boundaries right but um, being able to demonstrate their uh, empathy means that I can create a safe space for them to express their emotions and work through their concerns you know they have to they a, a, a therapy client doesn't have to um, know that the therapist feels what they feel or has been through what they've been through or or whatever but it, but the empathy for that is really important do you understand what I'm saying to you can you possibly relate to that um, even if you've not experienced in your life this these things are are important for clients open-ended questions is something that you'll experience a lot in therapy um, things like you know I, I tend not to say does that make you sad um, do you feel angry I mean I sometimes I do but but I'm more likely to say um, when you say that you felt angry what was going on for you in that moment or um, when you say that you calmed yourself from that panic attack what what was going on around you what were you able to draw on what were you saying to yourself um, you know things things like that I, I use open-ended questions that aren't yes no answers um, because it encourages the client to explore their thoughts and feelings in a little bit more depth it doesn't let them just have the easy out of being able to say yes or no or I don't know um, you know these questions that I ask don't have a right or wrong answer either um, and they allow the client to express themselves you know in their own words um, to be able to say what they're feeling in the way that they want to say it they uh, it helps them gain an insight too into in, you know what their concerns is and and develop a new perspective potentially I find that during a therapy session a lot of people will say to me oh, I've never I've never thought of it like this until this moment but this is what's happening you know and and a lot of therapy is done <laughs> by a therapy client in in the space where I'm able to actively listen show empathy and ask open questions they often come to you know moments themselves where they're like oh actually I think it's because of this or or they'll say you know they tell me something that's happened they say is that do you think that's because of my mum or do you think that's because of what my husband's done or you know whatever it might be I think a lot of them a lot of clients are coming to these realizations on their own without me um, which is kind of good and kind of like not so good I guess <laughs> um, but yeah no that's the benefit of therapy is to be able to provide that situation that environment where people can feel like they can come to their own conclusions right setting goals and having objectives is really important for therapy too you know working with clients I identify what their goals are um, and then we sort of work out together objectives for the therapy so there might be some specific issues the client wants to work on like they want to talk about their anxiety or they want to talk about their depression or whatever or broader goals like uh, they want to improve their relationships or they want to have better self-esteem um, and then we regularly sort of monitor the progress of these goals to ensure that the therapy is effective um, and that the client is seeing positive changes a really big part of that and something you'll hear me talk about a lot if you listen to a few of these um, episodes is we make goals small uh, and manageable and achievable and realistic and time sensitive as well so 
you know, we make the goals things that they can achieve, little little things. We track the process of those goals um, as we go and then we celebrate little wins along the way. These, these are really the important part of goal setting for me and, and for my clients because often a, go- a client will come into a therapy session with a massive goal that they really want to, uh, you know, achieve something really big and effective and life-changing and, and all all that's great, right? But what 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 tends to happen if if they don't achieve this huge goal in a few weeks, then people get very disheartened, discouraged with themselves, and tune out. And sometimes the benefit of that therapy is lost um, through you know just the goal being too massive and not unrealistic. So small goals that are manageable. Um, that you know are, are, are realistic um, that they can articulate into little small smaller words smaller aims um, things that are time sensitive so you know by this time of the year I want this or by this time tomorrow I will have made this phone call to this person um, whatever um, we track the process of those goals and then we celebrate little wins these are really really important components of goal setting um, for me and in this therapeutic process um, so how, how do we do it? Like what, what scientific modalities, what practices, um, does a therapist use? Um, they don't just listen and then you go like there's, there's a lot going on behind the scenes here. Um, and a lot of this stuff is, well, all of this stuff is research driven, is science backed, is, you know, evidence based. Um, and for me, there's different techniques and modalities that I use um, and it depends on what the person is presenting to me what their problem is what their issues are and who they are you know like what makes them them um, how they present to me all of this is important before we work out um, you know how they're going to get better uh, is how is what therapeutic te- technique or approach I'm going to use so we use the approach that's best suited for them, for them, for their clients, uh, for their needs. Sorry, um, their goals. You know, that might involve specific techniques um, like deep breathing, visualization, meditation, or or broader strategies like reframing negative thought patterns, how they speak about themselves to themselves. Um, all of those things are different modalities and different ways in which we can approach therapy with each individual client. And sometimes it's more than one. Um, You know, sometimes for different issues, different days and different times, I use a different modality with the same client. So it's, it varies greatly. Um, But as a broad kind of rule, I use five different types of therapy, which I know seems like a lot, but it, it, but it, they, all share sort of similarities um but maybe i thought i'd just go through the five things that i use um and you know you might be experiencing therapy with a different uh therapist or or with me (laughs) and you'll know some of these things or you'll know some of the questions and some of the the ways that these things are talked about so the first one that i use is cognitive behavioral therapy uh cbt this is probably one of the most well-known uh, modalities, the therapy approaches, uh, approaches, um, and a lot of different therapists use this for a lot of different therapy clients. It's goal oriented, uh, so again, setting setting smart goals, um, making them manageable, tracking progress, celebrating wins, uh, and it focuses on changing negative thought patterns and behaviours. So, first. Um, we work together to identify the client's beliefs and attitudes that may be leading to these concerns or contributing to where they are. And then we develop strategies strategies to challenge and replace them with more positive and constructive ones. Um, CBT can be particularly effective in anxiety um, and depression. And that's probably why it's one of the most widely sort of applied approaches to um, because it works in it with a range of issues um, 
It's effective for all sorts of different clients and problems, but it's particularly well suited um, for clients experiencing anxiety disorders, depression, mood disorders like that. Um, it can also be helpful for clients struggling with negative thought patterns or behaviors and those have experienced trauma or have difficulty managing stress as a result of that trauma. Um, so a lot of my clients are working through an unresolved childhood trauma. So CBT works particularly well um, for, for those people. The second modality that I use is a pro, uh, acceptance and commitments. <laughs> Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, I can't even say, uh, or ACT, sometimes you hear it described as. Um, it's a very mindfulness-based approach, so a centering and grounding and being in the moment approach that emphasizes acceptance of the client's thoughts and feelings rather than trying to control or eliminate them. So a lot of the time I speak to people about, okay, when you have this negative feeling, instead of trying to dismiss it or kill it or extinguish it or not feel it, I, I really encourage them through ACT to feel it, to really feel that feeling and going, okay, there's that feeling again. In the past when I've had that feeling, I've done this, but now that I have that feeling and I'm aware of it, I'm going to do this, the better option for them. The, so the goal is to help the client develop greater psychological flexibility um, and learn to live through or live more in line with these values and goals that they want to apply, right? Um, we use mindful te mindfulness techniques to help the client become more aware of their thoughts and feelings, develop a greater sense of acceptance and self-compassion. That comes through a, a greater emphasis on self-awareness really. Um, ACT can be effective for clients struggling with anxiety, depression, chronic pain. ACT works really well with a chronic pain. Um, complex PTSD works really well with uh, other issues related to negative thoughts or emotions, right? Um, it can also be helpful for clients who struggle with self-acceptance, with self-compassion, or who might be feeling stuck in certain areas of their lives a lot of the time uh, a lot of people will describe to me a sense of feeling stuck um, that they're not going backwards but they're not going forwards either and sometimes that's because they're not entirely aware of their own feelings their own emotions um, their self-awareness isn't isn't particularly great and therefore their self-compassion isn't really great so they feel very stuck and and in in a place where they can't go forward or back from um, ACT works really well with that. The third thing I use is motivational interviewing. I use this probably most alongside CBT, um, but it's a real client-centered approach that helps the client identify their own reasons for change, developing their motivation to make those changes. So what do you want to do? What do you want to see out of this? Where do you want to go? What do you want your life to look like? Um, and then once they've identified those sort of goal-oriented things, that's all about them, um, then we work out ways to explore their values and goals and then develop strategies to overcome any obstacles that are stopping them, that, you know, that might be preventing them from achieving those goals. Um, it's really important that we first work out their motivation, right? What they want to, what they want to do and then we work out how to how to get there this approach is particularly effective for clients who might be kind of ambivalent about making changes or who have struggled with motivation in the past um, motivational interviewing is often used with clients who have that ambivalence about making changes or might be struggling with addiction uh, substance abuse and other behavioral issues so it works really well in addiction both in a substance addiction and a process addiction um, it, because it allows people to see what they're doing that isn't helpful it allows people to say this is where I want to go um, and then we work out ways to go there because it's where they want to go it's very 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 much about what the client wants 
It's very client-centered. It's got very little to do with me or anyone else around them or in their network uh, or in their family or in their community. It's very client-centered, it has to be. Um, it's helpful for clients that might be resistant to change too or have um, difficulty seeing, setting and achieving goals because what you always come back to and what you always bring it back to is, hang on, this is what you wanted. This is what you told me you wanted, you know, and, and that works quite well because it's very difficult to argue with um, because it is their goals, right? Narrative therapy is the fourth one that I use. Um, it's an approach that focuses on the stories we tell about ourselves and our lives. It's very storytelling based. Um, so I work with a client to identify their dominant narratives, um, explore how these narratives might be impacting their emotions and their behaviors. Whose story is it? You know, are, the, are we living the life of the story that our parents have for us, that our partner has for us, that our kids have for us, that our society, our culture has for us? This is, this is an important thing to identify because then the goal is to help the client develop an alternative, more positive narrative that promotes growth and promotes change um, without blaming, without aligning, assigning um, you know, judgment to anyone else. It's just, you know, what's the narrative that you want to live? What story do you want to live? Um, it can be particularly effective with clients who've experienced trauma um, or might be struggling with issues related to identity, uh, self-esteem, self-awareness the the reason it works so well with trauma is often when somebody experiences a trauma particularly a childhood trauma it changes their narrative so it 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 gives them a new story that isn't theirs and they start to live the story sometimes of their abuse if that's if that's the nature of their trauma um and so it's just kind of resetting someone's narrative resetting someone's storytelling thing to bring it back to what they want to achieve the narrative therapy yeah as i said it's very it's very good in trauma abuse other significant life events that have impacted the sense of identity or their self-worth um, if somebody's struggling again with anxiety or depression it works well other mental health concerns and who maybe benefit from expo from exploring the stories they tell themselves about their lives the way they tell this the, the story that they tell their life, that impacts the story that they tell the world. And uh, storytelling is, is really important in my therapy and in my business, actually. Uh, this is <laughs> what we're doing right now. Um, so yeah, it's important that I, that I use some of that with some of my clients as well. And the last modality that I rely on quite a bit is using positive psychology. So is what it sounds like really um, it's an approach that focuses identifying and building the client's strengths and positive attributes rather than just addressing their weaknesses and problems it's very strengths focused so what are you good at what do you feel is positive about you um, all of those things help us work together to identify their strengths and then explore how they can use those strengths to achieve their goals overcome the challenges that they might be facing. Um, it's particularly effective for clients who might be struggling with low self-esteem or at least just have difficulty even recognizing their, their strengths. You know, sometimes I, I, I ask someone to write down three things that they're particularly good at and some people struggle with that, um, which is sad, but it's also telling in, in how they feel about themselves and where they are in their own psychology at the time and it's probably not a very positive place um, and again that feeling of being stuck in certain areas of their life this appeals to, to clients those that are feeling that as well um, and clients who are kind of seeking a personal growth or might be interested in exploring their own strengths um, growth is a very big theme within post positive psychology um, and it's something that we focus on and talk about a lot going from where you were where, to where you want to be um, and, and where you are in that spectrum. You know? um, and it's also really good for clients who are looking to 
sort of increase their overall sense of well-being and happiness. So a real um, big picture sort of thing, positive psychology is. So that's the five modalities that I use. And then another thing, or another part of therapy sessions with with me often is homework. Um, you know, I often give someone uh, clients one thing, not generally any more than one thing, to think about or to do in the time, the week, the fortnight, whatever it is, before we um, see each other again. So it's like an assignment, I guess, to work on between sessions, um, and that might just include writing down journaling you know their thoughts their feelings when they have a particular feeling what was going on write that down um that just pro really forces them to be mindful of those things and and really present in the moment when those things are happening it might be practicing relaxation relaxation techniques or engaging in activities that promote self-care um it can be Homework can be really valuable for helping clients apply the strategies, the stuff that they've learned in therapy to their daily lives. So that's why I tend to just go one thing because it's usually just one thing that we talk about in, in our therapy session and one focus. And then I go, and then I'll say, you know, okay, in the next week before we talk again next Friday, um, this is, I want you to be really aware of this, that we've, the stuff that we've talked about today, when does that happen? Why does that happen? What are you feeling around when that happens? Um, how have you redirected yourself when that happens? Um, yeah, whatever, whatever it might be. Homework is really valuable. It's not right, you know, it's not hours and hours of work or anything like that. It's, it's just think about um, when you have these feelings. Just be mindful of these situations and, and write it down or put a tally mark in your phone or whatever it might be. Just so you have a bit better awareness of what's going on um, session to session. Something I thought would be interesting to also mention here is what the therapeutic relationship looks like, the alliance between um, therapist and client. And it's something that's really important because it's built on, on the most important part of a therapy and that's trust. Um, th the client has to trust the therapist. They have to trust that they have their best interests in heart. They have to trust that they're going to keep their stuff confidential. They have to trust that they, that they believe in them too and that they can see the client has a, has a better future, has a better, you know, better opportunity. So the therapeutic, is, the therapeutic relationship is crucial and it's built on trust, it's built on empathy, it's built on that collaborative approach between the client and therapist. Um, a good rapport between the client and the therapist can help facilitate, I guess is the right word, positive outcomes in therapy um, and create a safe and supportive environment in doing so for the client. If, if we don't have that, we don't have any of it really. Um, it, has to be, it has to be a trust worthy rapport a relationship and i talk about being in relationship with my clients uh, quite a bit because that's what it is we we do have a relationship um, we have an alliance there's a therapeutic alliance between myself and my clients my clients and i sister janet would hate if I, she heard me say that um but that's it that's a really important part of the whole therapy relationship but certainly each session as well. So, and then the last thing is how therapy ends, <laughs> um, how the how the sessions end, and they typically end when the client has met their goals, or feels, you know, that they don't want to continue therapy anymore. Um, uh, we work together on a plan to create a plan, you know, for ongoing self-care outside of the therapy once the therapy ends um, and support after the therapy ends. And that might involve strategies that maintain progress, like practicing mindfulness, continuing their journal, um, continuing being aware of their feelings and stuff, and knowing that they can always um, come back and restart 
um, therapy if that's appropriate or that I can refer somebody else to them who, who can take them through the next step of their life and the next step of their growth uh, and their change. So that's how therapy ends as a, as a larger concept. But also I think since we're talking about how the sessions go, I think people often get a bit weird about how a therapy session ends <laughs> as well. So I, I'll just tell you how I do it. I, I tend to send a set an alarm that goes off on my phone five minutes before the end so that uh, so some of my sessions are 45 minutes right so i set an alarm that will go off in 40 minutes and so when that goes off it's a way for the client and me to know okay there's five minutes to go so we're not going to open a can of worms at that point we're, we're sort of wrapping up setting homework making sure they're okay checking in all of that but it lets me also for the 40 minutes up to that and the next five minutes to give my client my absolute dedicated attention i'm not looking at a clock i'm not wondering how long we're going you know i'm not worrying about the next session with the next client or whatever um but yeah it's for me it's just a way of us both being aware that okay time's up but we're going to start wrapping it up now we're going to focus we're going to check in we're going to make sure that everyone is okay um and that we can go to the next session from there. It's just much better than me looking at my watch, looking at my watch, you know, and, and the client going, well, he's not even listening to me. He's looking at the clock, you know. So that's a way that I do that. The other thing that's important to mention here, I guess, is that I don't, I have 45 minute sessions that are booked on an hour or an hour 15 gap. So I, that means uh, you might have a session with me from nine to 9.45 but my next session is booked in always at 10 or 10 15 so that I have time to finish with you um, debrief kind of with myself about that make take all make all the notes that I've been taking put them in the uh, the, the, the database the CRM um, and then be able to look at who the next client is look at their notes from the last session prepare a little bit for that and then um, going to their session so it's not just rushed it's not one in one out um, I, I can't do it that way I know other people do it that way but I, I it just doesn't work for me I'm I'm too scattered in my own brain sometimes when I'm not being mindful so I have to be really I have to be disciplined in that mindfulness for me to be able to go okay that's the end of that one here's the next one coming let's go um yeah, so that's kind of what goes into each session. I'd love to answer any questions you have or comments you have on any of that. Um, if you want to, you can hit me up at Nick Bowdish across all the socials or on the website at nickbowdish.com. Um, you can ask me some questions about therapy or, or give me some feedback on this session, answer any, but you might disagree with some of that stuff and I'd love to hear that. You might find that some of that stuff isn't happening in your therapy sessions and you want to know more about that then please ask me that too. Um, yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions about therapy sessions, how they actually are conducted and how they go. Um, that's how I do it. And I think this is a really good time to stress that everybody does it very differently. My, my therapist who I go to does it differently. So it's really important that you don't think that there's a broad stroke here. Um, everybody does these things differently. I just wanted to tell you how I do it, which I think might just cut some of the doubt and the worry maybe but also just that that unknown about if you've never had a therapy session that's that's how it goes um lots of open-ended questions lots of empathy lots of active listening um lots of different therapy approaches that are all evidence-based and backed by science and research um and then that's how they i wind them up with the little <laughs> alarm going off on my phone five minutes before and being able to check in and make sure you, you're doing okay. Uh, here's your homework for this week. You know, uh, I'll see you then. So that's kind of how I run it. Um, I'd love to hear any feedback or questions you have from that. But yeah, I hope that it, that helps. If you're thinking about engaging in a therapy session with a therapist, I hope it helps to know how I do that. Um, if you would like to work with me, then you can do that. Again, on the website, you just click on therapy in the menu on nickbaddish.com or hit me up as well across the socials and and i'll um yeah let's have a chat but whether it's with me or whether it's with someone else i hope that if therapy is right for you that you're reaching out and getting at 
started. Um, it's not scary. It's actually wonderful. It's changed my life. It's saved my life um, receiving therapy from somebody else. So I hope that uh, you're able to experience something as positive as that, as that from your own therapy as well. Um, we back. This is as I said. This is a bonus session. So again, on Monday, the next session, the next uh, podcast episode will drop. Um, but I hope you're having a good day wherever you are uh, and listening to this. Uh, I'd love to know how you listen to these two. Like, do you listen to these while you're running, while you're walking, do you, while you're relaxing, while you're trying to go to sleep? Maybe my voice puts you to sleep. I don't know if that's a great thing. But uh, I'd love to hear that too. Let me know. But uh, yeah, wherever you are and whatever you're doing, I hope you're having a great day and I hope you uh, are chasing the best, the very best version of yourself. All right. Hooroo.